this is what I really wanted to see. These are absolutely massive monitor lizards. God, they're big. <laughs> There's two cuddled up under a heat lamp on a rock there. There are nine monitor lizards of this species in a consignment of lots of reptiles and they were packed really poorly. So they were really shoved into a very small bag. So customs seized them. The other seven have gone off to zoos. One of the commonest things they'll do to warn you off is to use their tail. But you can hear him hissing. So. I'm at Heathrow Airport's Animal Reception Centre, which deals with the movement of animals into and out of the UK. I've walked past cages holding wild cats. I've seen inside boxes containing insect pupae. And right now, I'm in a room full of enormous monitor lizards, and these were seized because they were being transported illegally. Many of the animals that are held here are endangered, but they can still be imported with the correct paperwork. But as the demand for quirky and unusual pets is on the increase, some individuals are willing to bend or even break the rules. In this week's Costing the Earth, I'll be looking at the impact of trade in exotic pets, specifically reptiles and amphibians, on the creatures themselves and their environments, and asking if it's time for a ban. Reptiles have evolved innate and precocious, meaning that from birth they are gifted with able bodies and all the behaviours and thinking they will need to survive life in the wild. Their needs, wants, strategies and fears are inherited for millions of years of natural programming. And unlike humans or dogs, which have special traits that make them highly adaptable to new situations, reptiles are hardwired to nature. Whether wild caught or captive bred, they need to be wild. The stress of an unnatural life in captivity causes a raft of behavioural problems, and almost all reptiles show these. Just one stress-related behaviour is called ITB, interaction with transparent boundaries. To animal dealers, pet keepers and even many veterinarians, a reptile seen clamouring at the glass, like these, attracts almost no attention. To a behavioural expert, however, ITB is an important sign of stress. Scientific assessment and even common sense says the animal feels trapped and wants out. A human, dog or cat, with their adaptable nature, quickly learn that glass, even though it is invisible, is a hard barrier. Reptiles, however, are pre-programmed for life in nature, where there are no impassable transparent boundaries. To reptiles, transparent walls are non-existent forces of confusion and frustration and a self-feeding stressor. Like other captivity stress behaviours, ITB causes physical problems too, such as damaged claws and friction lesions as seen on these lizards. And I'm here in the reptile room with Rob Quest, who's the manager of the Animal Reception Centre. Now, Rob, this is really floor-to-ceiling glass cages full of the most beautiful and exotic creatures. What's this one here? I've um, got a sandboa here, and most of the animals in this room are um, protected species, so they need CITES permits, and that's why they've been stopped, because they've come through without them. This sandboa, then, beautiful chocolate brown snake, a couple of feet long, where does this originate from? Africa, North Africa, down into Tanzania. This was part of a commercial consignment, so their permits state how many they should be in a consignment, and um, this was one extra, so this one got taken out. Can you explain to me what CITES is and why it's so important? CITES is sort of an uh, international convention. It's a convention on international trade in endangered species of flora and fauna, so it covers plants and animals. So any endangered species on, on the listings, um, you can only move them around if you have the right permits. Some things on the highest listing, which is Annex A, there's no trade in wild caught animals, but you could bring in captive bred animals. And if an animal isn't on the CITES list, what, what's the law about moving it? If it's not on one of the CITES listing, then the only real thing that applies to it is the animal health paperwork, but for reptiles, there isn't any. Handling a wild species is very different from petting a domestic animal like a dog or a cat. In situations like these, wild animals often perceive the handler not as a benign companion, but as a predator. To many, this is the capture before the kill. Indeed, scientific observations have shown that even eye contact with a human 
can cause reptiles significant stress. And when a few reptiles do find themselves outside of their minuscule prisons, it is hardly a taste of freedom. Here, athletic reptiles try to struggle free and escape. Or strike out at passers-by, actively seeking to avoid contact. But striking at the glass can also cause facial injuries to the snake. For others, such as the terrapin, common defensive behavior includes withdrawing into its shell. Or like this tortoise, spreading out its limbs in an attempt to hook itself to surrounding vegetation or objects. But these measures are no defense against the animal dealer and the ever ready cash register. Are these animals coming in, in in ones or twos, or are you finding sort of big shipments of some of these species? The animals in this room at the moment have come in sort of on passengers, so in small numbers. But yeah, sometimes we do get big shipments of things that come through, and that more of a problem for us um, housing those. Yeah, um, and are they coming through without adequate paperwork often? If it's a commercial consignment and it's been declared, usually it's a technical um, issue that um, causes them to be seized. If you don't pack something correctly, it invalidates the site's permit. The other commercial way of get people getting things through is they misdescribe things. So they'll say there's something that doesn't require sighting permits when they actually do. Okay. Um, and are people passing off um, wild caught animals as captive bred as well? Yes, that does happen, especially with tortoises from Africa, like leopard tortoises and the hinge tortoises, because uh, often they will only issue permits for captive bred or ranched specimens. And so if people do get wild caught animals, they've got to pass them off as captive bred or ranched. And, and that is quite a problem for us, telling what's um, captive bred and what isn't. This is the challenge for the UK Border Forces CITES team, who track people trying to smuggle endangered species. Lead Officer Tim Luffman showed me a typical example. This package here is a, a black video cassette. I'll just open it up. This was sent through the post. Inside of that were some rare lizards. Um, we've had a number of cases of this recently. Um, obviously, there's no uh, concern about the welfare of the animal. This is simply put into a postal package, sent probably a week in the post, and yet you have endangered species in it. And this, no food, no water. They were very lucky to survive when they got here. But it's not just the smuggling of creatures that's causing concern. Many animals are brought into the UK legally for the pet trade, but they may have been captured in the wild. Others are captive farmed or captive bred, either in their native country, in the UK or elsewhere. Some groups argue whatever the source, the pet trade is causing unnecessary suffering to these animals, but taking them from the wild also damages the environment. And the demand for exotic pets is growing. According to CITES, between 2000 and 2010, the total number of reptiles imported into the UK, classed as either wild caught or ranched, rose from under 5,000 to almost 15,000. But those figures don't even include those species not covered by CITES or those bred in captivity. In fact, no one knows exactly how many there are here. The Pet Food Manufacturers Association, the PFMA, estimates there are 700,000 snakes, lizards, turtles and tortoises. Others think it could be nearer 7 to 8 million. Captive breeding remains economically unprofitable for a large number of reptile species. Hence the majority of these species are still coming to Europe from the wild. At this point in time, almost a fifth of the world's reptile species are at risk of extinction and this is according to a recent study and almost a third of the world's amphibian species are also threatened with extinction. In both cases the unsustainable collection of wild animals for the pet trade is cited as a contributory factor. The APA published a study in the Biologist magazine claiming as many as three in four of these pets die within their first year. I asked Elaine how they came to that figure. 
what we did over a five-year period was to compare the number of animals coming into trade against the numbers in private ownership and we worked out that over a five-year period an average of 700,000 reptiles per year were coming into trade. Around the same number were being kept in private homes but significantly the numbers in private homes didn't change year on year even with that additional influx of animals each year. So we very conservatively estimated that around 75% of reptiles were dying within a year in the home. And there are those out there who would question the reliability of the estimates that you've come up with. What would you say in defence of that? We would say that this is based on the best data available to us. This information was published in a, a scientific publication. It went through a very rigorous peer review process. And, and so we believe that information stands on its own. And it has been something that uh, has been around anecdotally uh, for years and we've now pinned it down. So you believe that there should be a ban on not just endangered CITES listed species but on all species of reptiles and amphibians? On all wild animals as pets we would like to see a ban. Reptile dealers and keepers commonly spread the idea that reptiles neither need nor use much space. This is absolute nonsense. Not only do reptiles lead active lives, often over large areas, but even if stationary and resting, they need to change body posture and position, for example, to stretch out as part of their own well-being. Of course, stretching out is not an option in a cage that's shorter than the animal itself. The relatively docile nature of these lizards make them popular. Although many people keep lizards in cages like these, it is overly restrictive and highly inappropriate failing to permit spatial and many other behavioural and physical needs. Should a small cat or a dog be forced to spend its life in an environment like this, the captor would face harsh condemnation and maybe also prosecution. And the APA isn't the only one to question the trade. The British Veterinary Association is currently re-evaluating its position on wild-caught reptiles and amphibians. Its president-elect, Robin Hargreaves, says it's inappropriate, even with controlled numbers. It's very hard to make any argument that the welfare of a, of a wild reptile could possibly be improved by being captured and transported. OK, so what about the position on captive breeding, then? It's not that it's entirely inappropriate. There are people who feel very strongly about exotics being kept as pets, but exotic pets can be accessed very easily by members of the public, and there's no requirement to exhibit any expertise in the keeping of those animals and sometimes the information that they get along with the animal can be pretty sketchy. There's a massive requirement for, for education both in uh, animal traders and animal keepers. Few people truly understand the importance of temperature in reptile life. Mammals, including humans, maintain their body temperatures physiologically from the stability of daily life to the high fevers of illness. Reptiles though must manage their body temperatures behaviourally by seeking warmer or cooler areas of the environment. Despite the term cold-blooded, reptiles need to be warm in order to operate at their physiological and behavioural optimums. Like us, when reptiles face challenges such as stress or infection, they too may need to raise their temperature to help. So the physiological fever of mammals, for example, is replaced with behavioural fever in reptiles. So many things, including immunity, metabolism and activity, are dependent on the right temperature at the right time. Emotional fever, digestion and physical reactions are all governed by how warm or cool a reptile is. Contrary to the beliefs of many who keep these animals, setting a constant temperature is actually a bad idea, as reptiles need both general and subtle temperatures that only they can determine according to their needs at a given time. Is there any way of measuring how happy or unhappy an animal is in a glass tank? I, I, I would imagine that with a reptile and amphibian it would be harder to understand how st stressed out or, or uncomfortable it would be, say, compared to a mammal. There's such a variety of species that I don't think it's possible to make a blanket judgment. I'm sure it's very fulfilling uh, to keep these animals in a good environment, but it, it takes some expertise to do that. There are only a few biologists in the world with a deep grasp of reptilian behavioural and psychological needs. 
and who have the ability to interpret complex abnormalities and stress. No surprise then that animal dealers and pet keepers alike are almost clueless. Most reptiles are anatomically mute, so there are no pitiful squawks, whines or cries to give away their misery. And because they lack the facial muscles to allow them expression, the very feature that humans so readily use to communicate and understand pain, joy, fear, stress and suffering, their state of mind, almost without exception, goes unnoticed. The European Commission is also currently working on new legislation to tackle invasive alien species, which may impact on the trade of some species of reptiles and amphibians. It's due to be published in the next few months. It's easy enough to go online or to a pet shop to browse a range of scaled or slimy creatures and not to think too much about where they were bred or their route to the corner of your bedroom. So just what can be the impact when they're taken from the wild? Traffic is the Wildlife Trade Monitoring Network and Chris Shepherd, Deputy Director of the Southeast Asia branch, spoke to me from Thailand. He says it shouldn't be underestimated. The volumes involved are, are huge. Uh, often we measure shipments by the ton rather than by the, the number of animals to the extent that many species have just been completely wiped out or are very close to being wiped out. And it, it just really can demolish whole populations of species and, and really have a serious impact on the environment where those species were. One of the species, the Roti Island snake neck turtle from Indonesia, and this species is considered commercially extinct. Very, very soon after being um, described as a new species, the demand for this in the pet trade went up so, so fast and the value went up so high that it wiped the entire species out in just a matter of a couple of years. What is the sort of the situation that's left behind in the wild? Well, you're just pulling out an incredibly important piece of a puzzle. There's going to be predators that are going to be lacking prey, and this is going to cause an upset in that, on that side of things. But you're also going to have, potentially have explosions of species that whatever the reptile species was preyed on, um, whether it's an explosion of a particular plant species or an explosion of a particular fish or mollusk. As soon as you remove something from the balance, it's obviously going to go all out of whack. When you're talking the pet trade, it's not a need. It's not um, a protein need or, or a medicinal need. It's purely a luxury good. Are you in favour of a sustainable harvest or an outright ban? In a, in a perfect world, you might be able to have sustainable trade in some of the species, but we have a long way to go before that happens in, in this region, just because the enforcement levels are lacking. Chris Shepherd from Traffic speaking to me from Thailand. The slow metabolic rate of reptiles means that many would not show signs of illness until long after they are sold. All reptiles carry bacteria, most notably salmonella, along with other microbes that are potentially harmful or fatal to humans. It is not only impossible to eradicate these germs from reptiles, but transmission is easy and infection common. People at increased risk of infection or at risk from serious complications of salmonellosis should avoid contact with reptiles. This includes children less than five years old, pregnant women, the elderly and those with impaired immunity. Like many other reptile related bugs, salmonella is routinely excreted and quickly spreads to occupy the wider environment. Animals contaminate the boxes, boxes contaminate the tables, Handling of boxes and animals contaminates people, their clothes, hair, car and the domestic environment. In the United States, pet reptiles are thought responsible for around 5% of all salmonella infections. In some cases, it may be as high as 18%. And that's just salmonella. A single reptile may carry dozens of species of bacteria alone. Keeping exotic animals as pets may be a luxury in Chris Shepherd's eyes, but that's not prevented some owners from getting rid of their non-native pets when they've become too big or even tiresome, in some cases into the British countryside. Back at Heathrow, Rob Quest showed me one example. You're going to get wet. I am going to get wet. So it's quite a beast. Um, this is a snapping turtle and they do get imported for the pet trade when they're just a couple of centimetres long because they're, when they hatch they're very, very small. Um, but unfortunately they grow. I mean he's, he looks 
well over a foot long, especially when his neck's extended. And then he's, he's nearly, a, what, 10 inches wide? And yeah. snapping turtles um, do get very big. And also they're very cold tolerant. So the problem is they can live in this country. Uh, you get them going up all the way into Canada. And this one was actually brought to us. Someone found it in a pond in London and members of the public got in touch with the RSPCA because they'd seen this turtle. So a single animal like this in a local pond, how much of an impact is it going to have there? It's going to be quite devastating really because if this is a small pond, you've got newts and toads which are themselves endangered anyway. Um, the fish in there wouldn't have come across anything like this before. Um, ducklings, you know, baby moorhens, it will take any of those things. Okay. And they have quite an appetite. So during the summer when it's feeding, it will take quite a lot of animals. They completely upset the natural balance in our pond. Totally upset the natural balance of the pond, yeah. How long lived are they? 60, 80 years, they're a very long lived animal. Wow. Are you seeing these um, exotic animals like this turning up more and more frequently? Yeah, certainly this, the story of, of snapping turtles being brought to us is, is a fairly common one. Uh, yeah, we don't get tens or hundreds a year, but we do get a few. Snakes as well get brought to us that get found in people's gardens. So, I mean, snakes are very good at escaping. So, so corn snakes, king snakes, things like that. So, you know, pet animals do get out in the wild. Pre-packed pets whose fates are well and truly sealed. It's all a far cry from nature. And as we've learned, reptiles can offer no cries of their own. So we have to do it for them. It's clear there's disagreement, not only over the numbers of animals kept as pets in this country and how many die each year, but also on whether a ban would help them or further harm numbers in the wild. Having seen so many beautiful and unusual animals during my journey, it's easy to see the charm of keeping them as pets. But I wonder what it is about us that we feel the need to keep these animals in our homes. Isn't it enough just to see them in the wild or even in a zoo or conservation park?